Hello, this is Vulturefire, and it's time for another Breach Wanderers patch breakdown. This is for part two of the Ether Storm update. Part one of the Ether Storm update was the last patch that review that I covered, which was for 6103. That one was the patch that contained Sheru. This patch contains a new area, a new system called the Weather System, and a bunch of other stuff that I'm going to talk about. First of all, I'm going to talk about the uh, click through here, the new map screen. And for this, I am going to throw over to myself because I am stitching together different videos. In order to get to the map select screen, you're going to click continue from the character select screen. You'll notice that on the character select screen, depth is no longer present. Instead, selecting your depth is part of the map screen. So on the map screen, you start by choosing your depth. So if we go depth one, you'll see only the first ring lights up because we are only going to one area. If we go to depth two, the second area lights up go to depth three, all three light up. Now, when you first just click through this, you'll notice that the areas selected are going to be the three you're familiar with. We have the mushroom forest, the ether plains, and finally the fetid coast. However, you'll also notice there is another area you can go to first, and this is the battered ramparts. I will talk more about the battered ramparts very soon, but for now, the important thing to notice here is that we do choose between each of these options and that for the second area, there are two options, but one of them isn't available quite yet. For the third option, you'll notice there's just the fetid coast. We can't swap between other things. It's just the one. There's also a random option. And so if you cannot decide where you want to go, you can choose this and it will give you one of the two. Now, when you do click on an area, you'll notice it tells you who, which boss you're going to fight. Now, this is only the end boss. This won't tell you which mid bosses are going to be present, but you can use this to sort of plan out your route. For example, you can see here you're fighting Ruby Dragon in Area 2. And so if I knew that my deck was not particularly strong against Ruby Dragon, I may want to go back and choose a different deck and then go forward. And now when I get here, this hasn't changed. It will not change until I actually start a run. Uh, and it, it won't change for this run. Like this is, this is this run. But it will change for next run once I have started this one. So this will be Ruby Dragon, and so I can change my deck to be something that will be, be able to beat Ruby Dragon. And I, I can also see who my Area 3 boss will be, which can be relevant because, for example, if you know you are fighting Hollow Maw, you may want to prioritize finding purity so and cleanse sources. And if you know you're fighting Bay later, you may want to try and focus on picking up some evasion. The other thing you'll likely have noticed is that, aside from the boss, it also shows these weird predictions. It says Mirror Mist and Blinding Clouds, for example. And you may be wondering what those are. Those are weather effects. Uh, what are weather effects? How do they work? I'm going to talk about that here in a moment. But for now, I just wanted to talk about the map screen. There's one other note I wanted to go over with the map screen is that with the randomness, you can only get one of the options that is shown here. So you will eat, if you go to the, the forest, you will be fighting Thornberry Chieftain, even if you choose random. There is no way for you to end up fighting Giant Lore Blossoms or Demented Munchroom with this setup uh, without running, doing a run and then starting another one. So Randomness just picks between the two options that you are shown. It does not reset the weather or the bosses. This also means that the random option in the second ring doesn't actually do anything right now. Uh, it doesn't matter which of these two I pick. I am going to still be fighting Ruby Dragon and dealing with Icy Gale weather. So that is it for the map screen. Moving on to other things. All right, moving on from the map screen. The new area is the Battered Ramparts. I mentioned it briefly on the map screen and you saw that you could choose between it and the Mushroom Forest and you can go to either one of them. The Battered Ramparts is a, an entirely new area. It has three new mid bosses, it has three new end bosses, and it has quite a few new normal and elite enemies and each of those has their own new cards just like the monsters in other areas. After you complete the Battered Ramparts, if you are playing on Depth 2 or higher, you will move on to the Aether Plains, just as you would if you had beaten the Mushroom Forest. Of course, if you are playing on Depth 1, you will just have won the run because there's only the one area. Here you can see a screenshot of what some of the nodes in the Battered Ramparts look like. You can also see that there is some weather affecting the Ramparts. Specifically, this is the Soothing Skies weather that is affecting this Elite fight, and this Gargoyle fight, and this uh, Scyther Beetle fight. And then over here, you can see the blinding clouds weather effect, which is affecting these nodes. You can also kind of see that there is a, a sunshine effect on the nodes that are affected. 
but the only actual fights that are affected are the ones with the icon. So even though this blinding clouds effect is kind of near the boss fight, there's no weather icon, so you can tell this fight isn't affected by that. You're, here you can see that in the Bad Ramparts you have a whole new backdrop. This is one of the boss fights. This is the Sleed Gaze. They are not friendly. They are jerks, although they have been nerfed significantly <laughs> over the course of the beta, so they are a lot more manageable now than they were. This is one of the mid-boss fights. Uh, you can see, yeah, we have a new background. We have new enemies. Lots of good stuff. The general idea for the Bad Ramparts is that it is supposed to be about the same difficulty level as the uh, Mushroom Forest. However, some of the enemies may be more difficult to certain builds, just because that is the nature of the game. Another thing is that because the monsters have different cards, and the Battery Ramparts enemies in particular have a lot of cards focused around strikes, and so strike-based decks, if you are playing one, will likely find themselves wanting to go to the Battery Ramparts. On the other hand, if you are looking for status-based cards, you may want to go instead to the Mushroom Forest, because you cannot get, for example, Arcane Aegis, or Lightning Grasp, or uh, sorry, Shocking Grasp, and so on from the ramp from the ramparts. You can only get those from the forest. So you may want to choose which area you want to go to based on which cards you're looking for. You may also choose because you just don't want to deal with whichever boss is the boss for the appropriate area. If you really don't want to deal with Demented Munchroom, probably will end up going to the battered ramparts and dealing with whatever you have to fight there. The other major new feature of this patch is the weather events. So you can see which weather events will appear on the map screen. I showed you that. Uh, I also showed you the icon that is on fight nodes that indicates that there will be weather when you do that fight. And so when you're in a fight that has a weather effect, there will be a passive effect, which will just apply throughout the fight. And there will also be a set of active effects. And the weather will do an active effect after the enemy turn. I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. There are currently seven different types of weather. And then depending on which weather you fight, at the end you'll be offered a weather card and each weather has three cards that it can give you. And so depending on the weather you fight, you will see different cards. Weather cards are special. They aren't affected by fatigue and they have powerful effects, but they also tend to have fairly powerful downsides as well. Uh, they are large and affect everyone usually to some extent. So here's an example of the Scorching Winds weather and the passive effect that it has, which is that while you are doing a fight in the Scorching Winds weather, Burn will deal three more damage, and the first card you play each turn will be removed from your deck just for that fight. Just similar to how, you know, if you play an Exhaustion, that's removed. And so this means that when you're playing the Scorching Winds area, you are fighting against attrition in multiple ways. Uh, you'll also notice in this, this set of enemies, I'm fighting a Fire Phoenix and a Drake, which is, uh, can be a particularly nasty fight to take when you are dealing with a weather effect. So here is an example of an active effect. So after the enemy turn passed, the Soothing Skies weather effect played this card, which is Empower to Everyone, which means I'm going to get two more powerful and two more played in all of my other stuff, but the AI core over here is also going to get two played it. So uh, that's just something I have to deal with and figure out a way to work around. So weather effects, as you can see from this, they are often going to be partially good and partially bad for you. For example, there's another weather effect uh, that will from the Icy Gale weather that will freeze all the enemies, but will also make them much, much harder to kill because it will give them a bunch of shield, it will give them ice barrier, it will give them tough, and then you'll just have to deal with that uh, as you try and fight through them. You can see here the weather card after you have finished a fight. This card is called Bask in Daylight. I'm not going to try and read it because that is a lot of words. I think I still have, oh, nope, I do not have the other weather cards. So I guess I will read this. It says, free, increase your recoverable health and heal six. Gain powerful three this turn and grow six. And then you give plated two to all enemies. And then this is removed for the rest of the fight. So most weather cards aren't removed, but this one is. Uh, so you can only play it once per fight. But so this is a powerful heal. It gives you a lot of powerful for this turn. It gives you growth to set you up for the rest of the fight. But in exchange, you have to deal with the fact that all your enemies now have plated two. And it's not temporary plated. They just have plated two until you get rid of it. So that is an example of one of the weather cards that you can get. And there are a total of 21 weather cards, three per weather with seven weathers. And you can look forward to finding all of those and trying them out because most of them are a lot of fun. There are also a lot of new generic cards. There are 14 new generic cards, 15 if you include Brittle Shield, but 
Brittle Shield isn't a new card. It was an Inna card, but it is now generic, and Inna has a new card called Sharpening Strike that replaces it. And here are three examples of the new generic cards that you can find. Pocket Shield, Mystical Ebb, and Drake Egg, which summons an allied Drake. It's summoned Dragon Friend. It's the only card you really need. Like, once you have Drake Egg unlocked, you just put that in your deck, and then you just try and get it, and then you're just happy because you get summoned Drakes, and how can you not be ecstatic about that? On top of the new cards, though, nearly every card in the game has been rebalanced. I'm not going to try and go over anywhere near all the changes. It's enough changes that it's difficult to even summarize broadly. But to do my best I can to summarize, the general overview is that dealing damage and applying status is now cheaper than it was. Damaging buffs and debuffs like poison are now cheaper to apply. But in exchange, card draw is more expensive and non-damaging buffs and debuffs like mighty got more expensive. So you'll find that Basically, every card has changed. You will have to probably rebuild all your decks or at least evaluate them and decide if you like the cards that you have or, or change them up. Some of the major upshots of this are that it is a lot easier to run decks that run fewer mana cards. In particular, decks that run uh, like zero to three mana cards are now actually viable instead of just being kind of jokes that you could do but really shouldn't. I do plan to have a video that is going to go in more detail about this whole rebalance, but for now... That is all I want to cover with that. Another thing they got rebalanced is some of the enemies. As part of this rebalancing of cards, we found that damage was a little bit too... It ended up buffing damage a little bit too much uh, for depth 3. So many enemies in depth 3 now have a bit more health. And that is... Not all of them. Some of them, you know, Hollow Maw, for example, is still at 1,200 health because that's still a lot of health. Uh, but you should find that this ends up playing out pretty well, that the, the new balance of the cards works out well with the new health on the enemies. Another thing is that Ruby Dragon in particular got nerfed. Uh, Ruby Dragon has attacks that scale based on how much burn you have, which it turns out it was scaling crazy fast. And a lot of players uh, mentioned that they would show up to Ruby Dragon, they would have like one cleanse card or two cleanse cards, and they'd have like one or two things of purity, but they weren't a fast deck, and so they, that wasn't enough, and they just got attack for 50 damage on turn like five or six. And it was just, there's just no way to deal with it. And you don't have any cleanse. You were getting attacked for like 30, 40 damage on turn three, a lot of the time. So Ruby Dragon is now less deadly than before. And if you were struggling with that fight, uh, you can breathe a little bit easier. It's still not a trivial fight, but it is slightly less murderous. So let's talk about some mechanic changes. First one, uh, status changed, specifically status maximums, how they scale changed. Frost changed on only depth 3, I believe on depth 1 and 2, it now scales, it still scales at the same rate. But on depth 3, regular enemies now increase by 10 per freeze, uh, up from 7. So the first freeze will cost you 10 frost, the second will cost you 20 frost, and so on. Elite enemies increase by 12, and bosses increase by 15. Uh, so you will find that chain freezing things is now a little bit harder. This is another one of those changes that is in part because st applying status got a bit cheaper. So that the trade-off here is you'll, you will likely find that your freeze decks are about as effective as they were before. Uh, it's just that the numbers on the cards changed, so the numbers on the enemies changed. Another change, though, that I'm very excited about is that Arcane and Shock now stop increasing after five triggers, which means that once you hit 20 sh Arcane or 20 Shock required in order to trigger detonation or apply a shock stack, that's how much it's going to cost for every other detonation and shock stack on that uh, enemy. For players, it will go up still after, it will stop going up after five times, which means that your normal maximum will be 20. But if you have uh, an item, so if you have shock amulet, which increases your maximum shock by eight, then it will be, then 28 will be your limit. Although usually as a player, if you are getting shocked more than five times or arcane detonated more than five times in a fight, that fight is already not going very well. Uh, so that won't happen for you that often. But what this does mean is that decks that are built around Arcane and Shock are going to have a lot easier and smoother of a time dealing with bigger enemies. One of the problems that Salon decks that were built around Arcane could have, or any, any character, but Salon in particular would often hit this, where against enemies that had more than like 100 health, you would find that your Arcane detonations start falling off. And especially against things like Maw or Bailator that have substantially more health, 
you would find that your later detonations were costing you 30 or 40 shock or 30 or 40 de arcane, which made your cannon blast progressively worse, made mystical mod worse and worse as the fight went on. And so that was a bit punishing for those decks. So this should make it a lot easier. And I have a lot of videos already recorded that you'll see where you can run arcane and shock focused decks and see a lot more success and and use those cards that care about that a lot more reliably than you could on the last patch. This is a pretty quick one. Burn now deals six damage per trigger instead of five. Overall, burn is about the same power level because enemy health went up by about 20%. So burn damage going up by 20% didn't change that much. But there are a lot of new changes to burn cards aside from this that you'll see when you're looking through the cards that makes burn overall still a fun strategy. Fatigue. So this is not the first patch that fatigue has changed. Now it is at you get one fatigue rank for every five cards drawn. Uh, unlike last patch, the threshold for each fatigue rank no longer decreases every time you get one. So it's just draw five cards, you have one fatigue. Draw 10 cards, you have two fatigue. Draw 15 cards, you have three fatigue, and so on. Uh, and that is still only extra cards drawn beyond the first five for the turn. Frenzy. So Frenzy changed very slightly, um, although it's, it's a relatively small change, but it has a big impact on decks that were trying to abuse Frenzy. So when you start a Frenzy turn, you only lose one rank of fatigue instead of all of your ranks of fatigue. This can be a pretty big change because it means that you will no longer have as easy of a time looping to uh, your frenzied rage and just playing it again and again because the cost of, if you, if you are having to draw a lot of cards to do that, you will find that it becomes harder and harder to afford your, your cards. Now, the actual increase from fatigue will still be fully reset between turns. It will just... So if you had, say, increased a card up to like 11 from drawing it a bunch of times, so its base cost is 2, but you've drawn it like 3 times, now it's at 11, um, it will start the next turn at 2, but if you have a bunch of fatigue left over, you'll draw it, and it may immediately jump from like 2 to 6 or whatever. So that is something to keep in mind if you are a fan of decks that are trying to take infinite turns. Another change. Adept, Mighty, Weak, Tough, and Vulnerable, which are all effects that previously were at 30%, now only have 25% effectiveness uh, by default. So Adept is 25% more status, Mighty is 25% more damage, weak things do 25% less damage, tough things take 25% less damage, and so on. Um, in his level four passive is still a plus 10% increase. So the new value is 35%, but that is te technically changed to the wording of the passive, but it is not a change to what the passive's effect is. Uh, and items that are like Blessed Belt that give a plus 20% bonus to a to Adept and Mighty and Tough, those are still at, those still work the same way and they still have the same numbers. So this is just a slight change to the base effectiveness of these uh, buffs and debuffs. Another change, Overcharge. So this is similar to the change that Arcane Leak and Bleed got in the last patch. So now allies and enemies with Overcharge have the same effect as when the player has Overcharge which is that when the player draws a card, everything with overcharge will receive two shock. This means there's a weather card that will let you apply overcharge to enemies. And this means that you can be, have the very satisfying experience of drawing a bunch of cards and watching all the enemies be shocked by what you've done. Poison blood. So poison blood before this patch said, whenever, you lost, whenever something with poison blood lost health, it applied one poison to all of its enemies. Now that's one poison per rank of poisoned blood. So if you have two poisoned blood and you lose health, all enemies get two poison. If you have five poisoned blood and you lose health, all enemies get five poison. This also applies for enemies. If you're fighting an enemy that has three poisoned blood and it loses health, you and all of your allies will get three poison every time that it loses health. Drophus in particular benefits from this change because Drophus's poison cards have been largely reworked and she now has more ways to get access to poison blood and thus the ability to stack up a lot of poison from hurting herself once she has a lot of poison blood built up. Sturdy. So Sturdy is now a bit sim more similar to Growth. So Sturdy is the plus maximum shield buff, Growth being the plus max mana buff. So now similar to how Growth gets a bonus for every six ranks up to 24 ranks, Sturdy now gets a bonus for every six ranks. The bonus for Sturdy is plus one shield from cards. You get a maximum of plus four shield from cards once you get to 24 sturdy. So this works the same way as items that give you plus shield from cards. 
and it will stack additively with any buffs you have from items. But for example, if you have a card that normally would give you 10 shield, and then you have 12 sturdy, that would mean you have a plus two bonus from sturdy. So instead of 10 shield, you get 12 shield. Uh, and if you have 24 sturdy, then instead of 10 shield, you would get 14 shield. Uh, Paladin obviously benefits a lot from this bonus because Paladin has the level four passive where it gets too sturdy for every time a status is triggered on an enemy. So that is incredibly valuable to Paladin to be able to get this extra shield, especially since Paladin, of course, likes being defensive. And this makes it a lot easier for you to actually fill up all that extra max shield that Sturdy gives you. Let's talk about some progression changes. That's it for the, that is it for the mechanical changes. So the first one, the default character has been swapped back. Uh, Salon was the default character last patch. Prior to that patch, Rowden had been default. And once again, Rowden is the default character. If your save is from Aetherstorm Part 1, so you didn't have Rowden previously and you haven't bought him yet, then on getting the Aetherstorm update, Aetherstorm Part 2 update, you will just immediately get Rowden for free. Salon, likewise, now costs 750 gold to unlock again. However, if you have a save from before this update, you will have gotten Salon for free and you'll still keep him after you update, regardless of whether you got him for free from him becoming a default starting character or if you just had him for free because, uh, or sorry, if you had bought him when Rowden was originally the starting character prior to, to get his Storm Part 1. So either way, you'll end up with Rowden. You will probably, if you are not a new player starting after this video, you probably are starting with Salon Unlocked. Uh, so hooray, two characters. Another thing that changed is the default starting cards changed. The list of cards unlocked by default has been changed. If your save is older than 6131, you will keep all of the cards you had, and you'll also get any new default cards that you didn't have unlocked yet. So for example, uh, Fireball is no longer one of the cards unlocked by default, but if you are loading a save that is older than the current one, which so an Aetherstorm Part 1 or earlier save, then when you load in, you will still get to keep Fireball, and you'll also get the new default cards uh, that you may not have. For example, Heroic Vigor is, a brand, is one of the new generic cards that was added, and you will get that one automatically on logging in, even if you have an existing account. Now, because of this, you may end up having an unusual number of cards unlocked. Normally, the number of cards in packs is a multiple of three, but if you are getting some cards held over, especially if you had opened some of the default cards, there are some of the cards that are default now, but not all of them, you may find that the last pack you open may have less than three cards because it just it just ends up that you have a number of cards left locked that is not a multiple of three just due to the shuffle of that. So if that happens to you, don't worry about it. It's just a result of you getting to keep your cards between saves and getting other cards for free. So speaking of card packs, the price of the card packs has been reduced. Prior to this patch, each pack of generic cards was 500 Ether. Now it only costs 400. And as a bonus, if you had purchased card packs previous to this prior to this patch, you will be refunded the difference for the number of packs you have already opened. Uh, so don't worry if you you know got the update today and just yesterday you were grinding a bunch and you bought you know five ten packs because you'll still get all that money back and you'll be able to spend the refunded amount on more packs or card packs if you have all the packs. Another change that is to reduce the amount of grinding, the XP requirements for level seven through 10 were reduced. This may cause you to automatically gain levels upon updating. Uh, so if you had gained enough XP that with the new lower amount, you hit the new level, you will automatically be at that level upon updating. You won't get a level up screen uh, or a congratulations or any of that anything like that, but you will unlock everything you would have normally. Uh, you'll have access to all the passives, all the character cards, etc., that you would get if you had gotten the level up normally from a run. And for an idea of what the total change is, in total, the amount of XP that you need to get to level 10 is now 10,000 XP lower than it was prior to this patch, which I believe the total amount is now 45,000 XP uh, prior, as opposed to the 55,000 it was before. So it's a pretty significant reduction in the amount of time it takes to, to push a character to level 10. Both this change and the change to uh, card prices are because as the amount of content in the game gets larger, the dev wants it to still be 
feasible to actually unlock everything in a reasonable amount of time. The goal isn't to set up an ever increasing grind wall, but to keep the amount of grind required relatively constant, even as more uh, content is added. So another change, this one is something that won't necessarily be immediately obvious to you as you play through the game, but the cards in the generic packs are no longer completely random. Instead, they are divided into invisible tiers that group together cards with similar theming. This is so that when a new player starts, we can ensure that a new player will get cards that will be useful to them early uh, and that they will also, when you start seeing cards of one strategy, you will see a lot of other cards that also fit that strategy around the same time. So prior to this patch, if you had gotten, let's say you opened Increasing Inferno or Fire Mastery or Firestorm and you get one burn card and you're like, okay, I'm excited to build a burn deck. And you open another pack and there's no, no burn cards. And you open another pack and there's no burn cards. And you open another pack and there's no burn cards. And this can keep going for quite a few packs because it was completely random. Now, because things are, are grouped by the general theme, if you open one pack that has burn cards in it, you can feel pretty comfortable in guessing that within the next few packs, you will see more burn cards to go with it. Another change, this one's for mobile only, but it is very useful for some mobile players, which is that there's now an option to toggle on high performance mode. So high performance mode, as the name suggests, lets you in reduce lag, increase the uh, just how smoothly the game will run and reduce battery uh, drain as well, according to reports from at least some of the beta testers. Your mileage may vary. But all of this in exchange for reducing the graphics quality somewhat. So you'll get less, you'll get fewer animations, you'll get uh, you know, lo slightly lower, lower graphics quality, but the game will run better. And so if you find that Breach Wanderers is running poorly on your device, try going into the options and enabling high performance mode and see if that helps you. Let's see, other changes. So these are just some of the smaller changes uh, throughout the patch. One of them is that the Reinforced Outfits Forge upgrade is now different. The upgrade now provides plus one max recoverable health per rank in addition to the plus 5% maximum health it provides per rank. So that means that at max rank, it will provide both the plus 50% max health and also plus 10 recoverable health, which means that most characters are going up to 25 recoverable health with all of these, which was a change that was made to make heal-based strategies a bit more appealing uh, because it is with a lot of the depth three enemies doing as much damage as they do, it was often the case that even if you had a decent amount of healing, you would just so often get hit hard enough that healing... You, you were losing recoverable health even if you were at you know your your recover your, your recovery cap and you took one hit and you lost health and so this is to make that happen less often it'll still happen against tougher enemies especially like bay later will do a lot of damage to you uh you will need to have some way to mitigate that besides healing but it is going to be a lot easier to use healing to help manage the damage you are taking this is uh drophus has health changed as well uh it was 30 it is now 35 uh, let's talk a little bit more about what happened to drophus so drophus's old level four passive was very boring it was just plus 10 recoverable health instead of having that she now has a new level four pass or her level seven passive has been removed to level four so the her level four passive is now 50 percent of self damage taken is also inflicted on all enemies uh, this works the same way it did before this is the passive she got at level seven now, at level 7, in, instead she gets a passive that affects poison. Uh, Drovis has always had a poison sub-theme in her cards, but her, car her poison cards weren't that good, and so the net result was that, especially with no passives to support it, poison Drovis ended up often feeling weaker than doing just pure damage Drovis. And so, in order to change that, new level 7 passive. And that passive is, poisoned enemies will deal 10% less damage, and they will take 10% more damage, and that, that includes they will take 10% more poison damage. So if Drophus is level seven and an enemy has 10 poison, they will take 11 damage. And so this passive helps make poison strategies more effective. It helps make Drophus more effective at uh, defensively protecting herself. This means that against enemies that are doing damage, Drophus with, by applying poison can, and then having weak and tough can have the same amount of damage reduction that Inna has. And if you've played with a tanky Inna, you know how effective that is. Uh, so instead of having that base plus 10 as her level 4, her base recoverable health is now just a flat 25. 
Previously, it was 20 until level 4 and then went up to 30. Now it is 25. That is lower than it was before. However, there is still the forge upgrade, which means that you can end up at a max of 35 once you have that forge upgrade maxed, which means that Drofus will still have higher recoverable health total than she did prior to this patch once you have that forge upgrade. Another change. So this is kind of a card change, but I think it's important enough to separate out from the card rebalancing and talk about specifically. And that is that Paladin's charge up now does something while you are supercharged. So the old functionality on charge up was that you just gain one energy and it's temporary. Now, what this means is if you are supercharged, you can't gain energy. So you play a charge up while you're supercharged and nothing happened, except you lost an energy from playing a card while supercharged. Now you gain an energy one and you get two mana if you are supercharged, which means that you can choose, if you have a charge up and you have enough uh, energy to go supercharged, you can choose between stockpiling more energy so that you can play more cards while supercharged or getting mana while supercharged. Of course, the trade-off of playing it to get mana while supercharged is that it will still cost you an energy. Uh, you still won't gain an energy because again, you cannot gain energy while supercharged, but it can help you if, for example, you have a charge up in hand, you're at zero mana, you press supercharged, you get your charged blade. You play charge up to get two mana, you play your charged blade, uh, which will cost you two mana. Then that will, if you have a level seven passive, give you another charge up, which you could use to then sort of bounce up and down between two mana and zero mana for as long as you have extra energy to spend. Charge up plus is now is still gain three energy, but now it gives you four mana instead if you are supercharged. Another thing you may have noticed when you were looking at um, this charge up plus is that the name is green. That is a change across the board to upgraded cards to make it easier to spot in your hand which of your cards are upgraded. So if you have multiple copies of a card, some of which are upgraded and some aren't, it is easier to tell at a glance when you're looking through your hand which ones are which, since that plus will often be hidden by the way the hand is fanned out other changes. Starting mana changes. So, prior to this update, when you started combat, you would start at half of your max mana plus your mana per turn. Now you will always will start at two mana plus half your ma sorry, two mana plus your mana per turn. This means you will end up not being able to stockpile a bunch of max mana upgrades so that you can start later fights with like 10 to 15 mana or more. In order to help ensure the fight still goes smoothly, you are guaranteed to draw a certain number of mana cards in your first five cards. And that number is based on the percentage of your deck that is made up of mana cards. So if you have six mana cards in a 15 card deck, that is 40% of your deck is mana. So 40% of your opening hand, which is to say two out of five cards will be mana cards. This will only affect the first hand of each fight. It will not affect any subsequent reshuffles or any subsequent turns. It is just to make it so that you don't find yourself in the awkward position of drawing your opening hand having no mana, and then falling over and dying, which did kind of happen a bit early in the beta before that change happened. So won't happen to you and you'll be happy. This is one of those things where even if you aren't consciously aware of it, you will feel that difference of guaranteeing those starting mana cards as you are playing. So that's it for this overview. This is far from everything in the patch. This is a large patch with a lot of stuff going on. So if you want to see full details, you can read the official patch notes and there's a link to that in the description. I also do plan to have additional videos on this patch coming out. I have a whole lot of runs recorded, which will be coming out daily from now until the backlog runs out. But then I also do plan to have more guides. I plan to have a weather guide up, a battered ramparts guide up, a guide to the new cards, and then a card overview video of some variety Although I haven't figured out how I'm going to, to structure it because I don't want to just talk about every single one of the 498 cards that changed individually, uh, I would die. So if any of that sounds interesting, once I've uploaded those videos, I will have links to those in the description of this one. But until then, uh, best of luck. Enjoy wandering through the breach. I will see you next time. Toodles.